Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Rajansky. I am the director here at the Kennan Institute. Uh, this evening, as you no doubt know, we're here to talk about developments in Russian theater. Uh, we'll get to this part of the program shortly, but we're also here uh, in commemoration and remembrance of our colleague, Edmita Bulota, who passed away almost two years ago after a long and brave struggle. Edmita served as a program assistant at the Kennan Institute, where she contributed to all aspects of Kennan's daily life. Though I didn't have the pleasure of getting to know Edmita myself, I'm proud that the Kennan Institute is associated with this series on theater in her memory, uh, and I'm extremely grateful to my colleagues who had uh, lots of experience with her and, and fond memories uh, who helped prepare these remarks, and so I, I just ask your forbearance as I read this on everyone's behalf. Uh, for those of you, like me, who never met her, Edmita is remembered for her strong opinions and force of personality that were forged during her time in Vilnius, St. Petersburg, and Houston. She also had a delightful sense of humor that was sharp but full of fun. She understood people and all their foibles and always celebrated what was good in all of us. She's dearly missed. Especially formative during Edmita's many personal journeys was her life in the theater. She graduated from the State Theater Arts Academy in what was then Leningrad, where she studied theater management. She then spent a career in theater in Lithuania, where she worked in the opera and ballet theater, the puppet theater, and the youth theater. So to honor Edmita's memory, we're tonight holding the second Edmita Bolota lecture on Soviet and post-Soviet theatrical arts. Before we get underway, I want to note that we're pleased to be joined tonight by Peter Bolota. Where is Peter? Right there, Edmita's husband. By way of introduction to our program, I'd also like to open with a quote from Konstantin Stanislavsky from an, author, from an actor prepares. If the whole point of theater were merely to entertain, then perhaps it wouldn't be worth putting so much work into it. But theater is the art of reflecting life. Who better than Stanislavsky to get, the essence, to get to the essence behind tonight's lecture? Perhaps Edmita herself. According to Peter, Edmita would say that theater must say something or expose or change something. If not, it is a total waste of time, nothing more than kitsch. We're very pleased tonight to have Grigory Katayev with us as the main speaker. He's a film, television, and theater director based in Moscow. He's a member of the Russian Union of Cinematographers and the Russian Film Directors Guild. He received his training at the Superior School Studio of the Moscow Academic Art Theater uh, in stage design, and then later studied feature film direction at the Russian State Institute of Cinematography. His most recent stage production is the 2013 Betrayal Majesty. It's a historical tragedy by Yuri Spitalny about Prince Andrei Kurbsky and his escape from Tsar Ivan Grozny the Terrible in 1564. He's directed a number of other major productions in Moscow. Those of you familiar with Russian television will almost certainly remember the serial My Life, a 28-episode feature TV series that Grigori directed and was first broadcast in 1999. My Life presented the life story of Anton Chekhov and starred Oleg Afremov, the famous Russian actor and principal director of the Moscow Academic Art Theater. He likewise has an impressive list of additional film and television projects. In addition to his work as a director, Grigori is a dedicated educator, teaching courses on deli or delivering lectures at institutions such as the Moscow Institute of Television and Radio Broadcasting, Astankina, the University of Kentucky, Lexington, Washington and Lee University, right here in Virginia or nearby in Virginia. And soon after his lecture here, uh, he'll start a course at the Russian State University of Cinematography. Beyond his art, Grigori is a keen observer of and commentator on social and political issues. And this evening, we're fortunate to hear his views on the intersection between those, between art and society in Russia, and the importance of theater today for Russian society. We're also pleased to be joined by Yulia Savchenko, uh, whom I've had the pleasure of working with a number of times at Voice of America in her studio. Yulia currently works uh, for Voice of America's Russian service, uh, where she covers congressional and political affairs and anchors the telepro television program Padilis, or Share. She's received two excellence awards from the International Broadcasting Bureau. Uh, before joining VOA, she reported for BBC World Service from London. She's testified before the U.S. Congress 
uh, and the Helsinki Commission, has been interviewed by major U.S. news outlets. She is a graduate of Stanford University's Program for Democracy, Development, and Rule of Law. Uh, I myself am a Vuposnik of the neighboring CSAC program, the Security and Arms Control program, uh, and is a recipient of the Reagan Fasco Fellowship from the National Endowment for Democracy. So we have really a fantastic evening for you, uh, and if you were not already stuffed full of food and drunk, uh, you're, you're going to enjoy it anyway. So thank you so much for joining us, and I'm going to hold, uh, hand over the floor to Grigori. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here uh, and to give this uh, um, modest lecture. I would like to express my gratefulness to tonight's moderator, the director of the Kennan Institute, uh, Matt Rajansky, and to the former director of the Kennan Institute, uh, Dr. Blair Rubel, and uh, to the deputy director, uh, oh, can you hear me? Now, oh. oh, should I start fr from the beginning? Or no, no, okay. <laughs> um, so uh, <clears throat> I also would like to express my to, to express my thankfulness to the former um, to the former uh, to the former director of the Canon Institute of Blair Rubble, and to the deputy director Will uh, Pomerantz and to the pro program associate, uh, Joe Drazen. They all invited me here, and uh, uh, I appreciate this invitation very much. I also would like to thank, to express my thankfulness to, um, to Ms. Eleanor Sutter, the senior American diplomat, who inspired me to, uh, mm, for, this, for that talk, and uh, who, gave me, who gave me important advices uh, not all of which I unfortunately um, am able to, to follow. <laughs> um, uh, I wouldn't even call my lecture, uh, my, 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 uh, my, um, my presentation a lecture. It's, it's, more, uh, it's more like a talk. I just would want to apologize for my English because it's not so, um, which is not so good as it seems at the beginning. And um, <clears throat> I also should say that I'm not an academic scholar. I'm not a, the I'm not a theoretician. Um, I'm uh, a film and theater director, so I dare to ask you for your, uh, for your con condescension and indulgence to the way I speak and uh, to the way I try to deliver things. And please forgive me that I will refer to uh, my text because it's in English and I, it's still not my, not my native language, though I'm trying, I'm trying hard to uh, speak English. Um, it's sort of a challenge for me to speak uh, on a subject which is important uh, for any developed society uh, in the contemporary world about the theater and uh, in particular about the contemporary Russian theater um, as the mirror of, uh, of the today's Russian social and uh, political um, and political issues. And I appreciate that you, the Americans, um, are interested in that subject. Uh, there is a good theater joke uh, a chief artistic, uh, a chief artistic stage director, uh, mm, he tells to to his actress, "You played so incredible today. Uh, all your all all your sufferings were so real. The audience, uh, it was in tears, uh, and this is such a success." And um, mm, the actress and the actress um, uh, and she replies. Well, it was a nail in my shoe. I couldn't t take it out on stage, and I had to suffer each time I, um, I had to take a step. And the director exclaims, please don't uh, take it out until the end of the season. <laughs> so I dare to say that 
that all uh, all contemporary Russian social and political issues are like that nail which helps to create some real theatrical actions and keeps them alive, uh, which the snail, which uh, serves as a fuel for uh, speeding up the, the relevance of, 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 um, of the today's Russian theater, if I may say so in English. Uh, this kind of issues, uh, they might be hidden from the surface of life and scaredly avoid in the conversations, or in the opposite, they uh, might be very visible and much spoken about in Russia. But <clears throat> all of them, they play this, uh, uh, they, now they always play this role of a nail. Uh, the famous French aristocrat, um, a historian and a traveler, um, Astolf de Custine, uh, he, he, he wrote about Russia at the beginning of the 19th century. He wrote, the Russian empire is a huge theater hall, the theater audience, the theater auditorium, where everybody sitting in boxes, in the, in the lodges, in the theater boxes, uh, uh, carefully watch only what happens behind the scenes. This can be entirely attributed to the Soviet era and this uh, mm, trend <clears throat> is observed even today because we do not know uh, how the important decisions are made, uh, who makes them, how they are uh, taken by the authorities uh, on top and why they are actually accepted by Duma or by Kremlin or uh, by some, uh, some social organizations. Therefore, theater in Russia, uh, it has always been not only the place where people uh, uh, go in order to see some funny or scary stories, but, uh, but mostly to understand, to comprehend what's going on around uh, and how to treat the situation. What are the uh, waves from the top? What are the trends? Uh, life in Russia has always been extremely regulated. Uh, in the 19th century, Tsar uh, Nicholas I, he was a literary and theater censor himself. He supervised the plays written by Gogol and by Gribayedov, the famous plays The General Inspector by Gogol and The, um, <clears throat> the Woes from Wit by Gribayedov. They were censored by, uh, by Nikolai, uh, by um, Nicholas. Uh, these, uh, these performances, these plays were very, uh, were very brave and very relevant for those times. And uh, only by the approval of the highest authorities, they were able to, um, to uh, be delivered to the audience. Uh, Stalinist leadership imposed on theaters everywhere in the country, allowing them to play a small, rather small and chosen circle of plays. Um, I'm sorry. Um, the chosen plays in in aesthetic and um, and the principles of the of the socialist re of the, the ideological principles of the socialist realism. Uh, the Western and especially probably American theater has never experienced such a pressure, such a po political pressure. Uh, and not only a political pressure, but also a pressure of the specific social and cultural uh, and cultural influence, uh, which, was, uh, which was supported officially in, uh, in the Soviet Russia because usually the Russian Soviet leaders were not 
uh, well educated. So their views and their uh, um, their approach to the theater, to art in general, was very um, very narrow minded. Uh, today, the ability to uh, to create uh, um, the dialogue with the audience, with the young audience especially, uh, it came again as it was in the in the times of the Khrushchev's Thau. Thau? Thau, right? Um, uh, in today's in today's Russian theater, there are many very gifted uh, people. Sometimes, what I see in Moscow theaters, I don't like um, aesthetically, but uh, but often it's not designed for the aesthetic um, uh, perception. And I like these these performances as an act, as a social and even political gesture, if you understand what I mean. And these, and these performances, they, uh, they get a lot of attention and, and, and gain success. The first, uh, the first performance which I would like to uh, speak about <clears throat> is named Life is Successful, or uh, better to say maybe uh, Lucky Life. Uh, this is uh, Pavel P. Uh, Ryashko, the, uh, the playwright, the, the author of this play, and the director, Mikhail Lugarov. This performance is staged uh, at the theater dock and at the same time, uh, together with the Center for, for, dr for Dramaturgy and Stage, and stage um, uh, uh, Directing. Um, for years in the Soviet Union and then in Russia, we had a saying uh, that uh, it was not even uh, a, mm, uh, a proverb, but a kind of a, a popular saying that uh, it's very hard to find your own place in life. Now, since maybe eight or ten years ago, this this proverb has changed into another another statement, which creates a new social comprehension. It sounds like that. It's not at all hard to find your own place in life. On the contrary, it's very easy. The hard thing is to accept that this is the place is really one you deserve. Uh, this saying, it concerns the characters of this performance absolutely directly, but in the sense that um, they, do not, uh, um, they do not seek to achieve anything, any goals, and they do not suffer uh, when they fail because they are not on the way of achieving something. Uh, the play, uh, the play, um, the successful life, the lucky life, is about another so-called. Well, th we, I might say, the the opposite uh, type of young people. Uh, it's not the golden youth yet. Uh, mm, uh, two characters, two 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 characters, two brothers. They uh, are teachers of physical education, gym at school. And another two characters, two adult teenage girls uh, who have love affairs with them, with these brothers. And Alexei thinks he loves Lena, but Lena, her friend Angela, and Alexei, the, the friend of, uh, and the other guy, um, mm, uh, the Alexei's friend Vadim, they think almost nothing. They just uh, trying to have fun, and everyone seems to like it. Um, and Alexei thinks he loves Lena so much that he decides to marry her. And Lena agrees to marry him, not because she loves him, but just because it's some kind of, uh, some kind of activity, some kind of fun. In fact, the plot is the story of, of the preparing of this wedding, then their registration, 
at the um, at the mayor's office, uh, at the city hall, where they all come with their friends, and and afterwards in the evening, how they spend time drinking and eating. They're they're all a party who was invited there, and. Uh, All um, as it all was in uh, terms of style and uh, and manners. Um, Alexei is so upset that Lena seems indifferent to him that even uh, and and um, and even at the at the at the wedding that he gets drunk and falls asleep at the uh, toilet. And Lena thinks that Vadim is still better, so uh, when, they, when they come out uh, in the street, uh, she has sex with him under the trees, and Angela, her friend, she doesn't care about that, and no one cares about nothing. And at the end of the play, uh, Angela, the, uh, the friend of Lena, she uh, tells us to the, to the audience that uh, that Lena and Alexei have um, they have divorced in three months, uh, well, just after their their wedding in three months, but uh, they still they still co continue to hang out, uh, and and no one is uh, and no one is upset. Uh, the guys two two guys they are not that happy with how much money they earn, but they feel rather comfortable uh, for the moment, and they know how they can earn more and what kind of business can bring them money. And in general, they always keep saying that, uh, that the life is successful, the, the, the life is lucky. They are generally satisfied with the way they live. Um, this this performance, this uh, play is full of uh, the obscene words, uh, bad obscene words. And when you mm, watch this play, when you hear to the conversations, at first, uh, well, of course, you, you experience shock. But then you understand that these words, they are, the way they are used, it's not the bad words as a bad words, but as a full-fledged manner of speech. It's just the way they speak. So in 15 or 20 minutes, you get used to this kind of, of obscene style of conversation. Boys and girls, all of them, uh, they speak in this manner. And uh, at first, you think that they are just uh, mocking and, and joking. And because it's really impossible to realize that they do not play the role of some of, of, of such specifically rude people, uh, uh, they uh, uh, the shock it comes when you realize that they do not that that they do not pretend they do not play this role they 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 are the way they sound they are the way they talk they are not mocking they're not joking um, and it's not only the manner of their speech it's the but also all their behavior all their their moments of their gestures all their moments of their approach to each other um, it's the manner of uh, how they treat people around themselves, the older people, the younger people, and you get extremely frightening impression. Um, this is uh, probably one of the most shocking performances in the contemporary Moscow uh, theater. Um, The total uh, indifference which you, which you feel from the uh, stage, from these characters, 
the total indifference to everything and to everyone, uh, the total absence of any kind of mm, mm, goals, moral, uh, moral concepts, um, uh, some, uh, some aesthetic views, um, absolutely wild state of uh, soul of these uh, nice uh, boys and girls, well, adult, adult, already adult people. Um, and uh, you realize that this kind of people, they can be guided uh, by any kind of, of statements under any kind of uh, flags. They are very reactive to the, um, mm, to the slogans which seem, uh, which seem profitable for them. Um, it's, it used to, um, some uh, people used to say, it, it, it used to be understood that, that <clears throat> I'm sorry for my English, <laughs> that Russia um, uh, went to uh, so-called Russian liberty too fast from the uh, period of slavery. And that's why we had a lot of the traces of, uh, um, uh, of, of such kind of slavery in the souls when people do not mm, um, adapt themselves to the civilized world, that they don't care about each other. Um, and, and that's what you see very strongly from this, from this per performance. Um, the, the impressive thing is that uh, when you look at them, you would never say what kind of people they are. They look very nice. They look, uh, well, even charming. Uh, it's only when you start hearing to, to what they say and how they, and how they, uh, they speak to each other, then you understand, uh, then you get shocked. Um, at the same time, uh, these people, they are not criminals, they are not scams. Though it seems always, it seems that they can easily become, um, well, become um, frauds. And very likely they will, uh, they will become some kind of, of scams in their nearest future. Um, we all know this uh, quote from, uh, from I I I I Immanuel Kant, that there are two main mysteries in the world, the starry heavens above us and the moral law within us. The characters of this play are the people for whom this thought, this, this comprehension uh, does not exist, as if it does not exist for them. Uh, there can be uh, there can be a situation where, when when you understand that that everything isn't really good, but it's still close to encouraging. And there can be a situation when you see from a side that nothing good will happen. There is a strong impression that these people will never become become human in the fullest sense of this word, of of of. Um, of this word. Uh, what are these creatures? Who are them? Where did they come from? Uh, is it uh, possible to judge them? I don't know. It's very difficult to, uh, to give an answer. But this kind of people, for different reasons, in the last 10 years have been largely presented uh, in Russia. Uh, uh, not, not, not completely, but in a, in a substantial, in a substantial sense, they started to define the face of the country, and that what frightens, and that why this play, uh, this play was written and and came to life. And this play 
gives you a terrible guess that yes, it is a disease and uh, probably its name is, uh, is degeneration. Um, this is a uh, display in another theater, in the, in, the, in the theater, in the theater, in the theater Praktika. Uh, it's also staged there with, uh, with another actors, but uh, absolutely the same play. The next performance I would want to, to tell you about is Uh, Pavel Preshko. He lives in Belarus. He is Belarusian. Well, he often comes to Moscow, so he is considered to be half Belarusian, half Russian. He lives in Minsk and in Moscow at the same time. And the director is Mikhail Ugarov. In in uh, in Russian, this play is uh, this play is called Жизнь удалась. It's not easy to translate into English. This kind of thing. Um, the famous novel written by Venedikt Yerofeyev, whom you see here, the famous Russian writer who has already uh, passed away uh, rather long ago. Um, uh, the name of this, uh, the poem, it's a prose, but it is called a poem. Uh, it's Destination Moscow uh, Petushki. It's the name, the um, the name of the little station in the in the suburbs of Russia. Uh, Petushki in English, it's a cockerel's. Uh, it's funny uh, children's name, but it's a, it's a uh, well actually it's a, it's a suburban railway station. If you had to comply a list of pros. Not, uh, not suitable for adaptation or dramatization, not suitable for screen version or a theater performance. The, uh, the Benedict, uh, the Benedict Yerofeyev's uh, poem, uh, Moscow Petrushki, would be one of the first three leaders of that list, if not the, the leader, uh, not the first one. Uh, so this is him also. The director of, of this performance mm, uh, that was recently staged in Moscow at the Studio of Dramatic Art is uh, Sergei Zhenovac, very well-known uh, Moscow theater director. Uh, the alter ego of the author, Venichka Yerofeyev, just we call them, uh, him um, um, Venichka, he goes from Moscow to the Moscow district center uh, called uh, Petushki. Uh, there lives a girl, amazing and unique girl, whom he uh, loves, and he visits her by on on um, on Fridays. He bought a a bag of candies as a present for her, and he begins his journey to the station to catch a train. But somehow he drinks a bit of vodka and he turns to another street and loses his way. And then in another street, he, uh, he's being unsatisfied with, with his life and with everything he sees around. He drinks some more vodka and uh, he becomes more enth enthusiastically drunk. And he starts uh, uh, talking to his angels who who sort of accompany him all the time as if he lives under their supervision it's very uh, poetic and very beautiful though um, mm, the subject of his mm, talks of his conversations with angels um, are very simple all the subjects um, and then he goes to the center of moscow to look at the kremlin he wants to see kremlin uh, although he knows that nevertheless where he goes he will still get to the Kursk railroad station, railway station. But surprisingly he did not get there but got onto some unknown, unknown staircase somewhere 
um, where he drank again. And finally, at the down, he gets to the station, to the cafeteria, and he and he becomes rather ra and and he becomes rather desperate because uh, um, it's no alcohol at the cafeteria. So he 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 goes out again, and and somehow he gets a bottle of vodka. And um, um, and he buys the sandwiches, and finally he gets on the train, and um, he drinks while the train uh, passes the segments of the path in between stations. Um, the names of the stations they are very Soviet, very boring, very dull, and. <coughs> They say a lot about the Soviet era, and uh, in this in this condition, in this condition, Venichka is able to um, recall different sad stories from his life, full of black humor. Um, how he was unfairly and un unfairly fired from his plant, from the plant where he was working, and he dreams of uh, of. Of this redhead girl with whom, uh, with whom he is in love, and at the same time he feels more and more lonely, and gradually he becomes more and more drunk, and he starts to talk with his neighbors in the train, and uh, we see his shining philosophical mind and his erudition. Uh, but he, but of course he doesn't receive any any understanding. And. Um, and strangely, he starts to dream about the revolution, as if, uh, as if, um, as if um, desiring to change things at once, as if he wants to change things at once. And weird, and weird phantasmagoria begins. And somehow he finds himself on another train on his way back to Moscow. He goes, he, he, he does not realize how he got there. And having arrived in Moscow, Venichka, yet on the platform, is immediately attacked by four street thugs. And they beat him. He tries to escape. He runs uh, to the Red Square. He wants to see Kremlin again. It's 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 some kind of we of 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 weird uh, pursue. Uh, they run they run after him and and suddenly he runs onto the red square and and uh, and here he sees the Kremlin, but but immediately he finds himself somehow inside some unclean uh, un unknown entrance to some to to some unknown building. And these uh, and these street uh, thugs they uh, corner him, uh, poor Venichka, and they kill him with a knife. Uh, all this story is a metaphor, it is a metaphor um, about the world which is which is hostile to you. Um, that does not accept you, about you being a stranger to the society you live in. It's about a person who can find himself in this reality, then trying to run away, to hide from it with the help of alcohol. And uh, at the same time, he, he, he hopes um, it will help him to survive, to rescue him by uh, putting a, di a a, a sort of a distance between him and and the cruel world, but the reality still uh, still kills him brutally. Uh, there is no direct answer um, uh, why uh, why he drinks so much, but uh, this is the as the circumstances of of the time and of the place. Who would have a who would have a, a courage with a clear co consciousness to exist in those in in those latitudes uh, with those uh, life details and with those and and with those uh, people around and the faces around? 
uh, one needs a fog or some kind of of the anesthesia, anesthesia. Anesthesia. Thank you, to try to survive, to live in uh, in a tolerable uh, conditions of of one's imagination, uh, and. Um, and it's a joke about uh, about Russia. Why the dry law? Uh, it cannot work in Russia. Um, it's because it's too scary to look at the country with a sober glance. Um, uh, Venichka, uh, he has collected everything what is hated by the the uh, um, uh, the authorities, the absolute, uh, the uh, the courage, the the brave, the fearless inner inner freedom, which no uh, no cops, no secret spies, nor executioners can uh, cope with uh, executioners can uh, cope with, and it's interesting that this poem is uh, staged in the theater now as if the stagnation sensations of the of the Brezhnev's era start to to uh, to emerge again um, the way of looking at things the way of interpreting life of the end of the 60s uh, and beginning of the 70s when everything around was very drab and the bureaucrats and the authorities were very far from people, this feeling is like, well, it's sort of back now, uh, at the beginning of the 21st century, when everything in our lives and in the streets of, of, um, of Moscow is, is, also absolutely, um, is also absolutely different, but still very much aligned to the human being in another way. Mm, unaccessible, expensive boutiques and uh, and incredible restaurants, unfriendly faces of the guards in in uh, at the entrances of them, the huge abyss between the working people, the 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 people in general, um, and even the high professionals and um, and the layer of the richest of the richest businessmen and the and the owners of the companies who does not seem to care much about the rest of the society. This uh, also, it makes, uh, it makes a different, uh, uh, the, the different, the, uh, it, it, um, it makes another approach, but very similar to this unfriendly feeling of the, of the city of the, and, and of the society. Um, so uh, for many people, um, all the all the decorations of our contemporary life in Moscow, the quantity, the the huge quantity of the uh, of the of the luxury cars, of the limousines, of extremely fancy and expensive-looking people, cool, successful life, everything which is shown, uh, well, maybe not on pu purpose, but still, mm, uh, but still it is shown very openly and without any hesitation and life and manner which make other people think they are just losers and they hardly have any right to walk on the earth on 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 earth for many people it's a very sensitive experience which they go through every day in moscow and for many of them vodka is the only way to find at least some some uh, sort of of the consolation and some kind of the relief and maybe even some spiritual harmony um uh, known uh, uh known po political leader the the liberal leader Bo um Boris Nemtsov, he said recently that life in Russia has become much, much, much better, but at the same time, much more disgusting. Uh, so, um, for for us, it's very uh, penetrating and very insightful story, which is very relevant um, to the today's Russia. And it's for for me. It's very uh, it 
it says a lot that uh, this story is um, is staged and very much and very much spoken about now in Russia. Uh, the next show that I would like to say a few words about is Inhabitants of Heaven at the P Araktika Theater. It is um, staged by, by, Ruslan, by Ruslan Malikov, the young uh, theater director. The very name of the play, uh, The Celestials, the gods of the Olympus, mm, it implies that its characters are not the ones with whom we, we cross mm, in everyday life but uh, that we are dealing with a myth mythologized existence of those who dwell only on the, on the covers of glossy magazines and uh, the tabloids and scandalous, uh, and scandalous c um, uh, um, uh, chronicles. Uh, this uh, very relevant play is written um, uh, it's about business, about the supermodels, about the TV hosts, about the talk shows, about the po po political um, uh, 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 and the criminal po um, cases of the last 15 years of Russia. Was written not by the playwright, but by the director, the general director of the corporation Xerox EuroAsia, uh, Igor Simonov. He never, uh, he never wrote any, any plays before that. And he wrote this play and it became very successful. So this is him. And this is Ruslan Malikov, the theater director. Um, the main hero, Leonid Zaitlin, the chairman of the old company, the charismatic man in his 40s. He is very cynical, outspoken. Uh, he, loves, uh, he loves the spontaneity in girls and he appreciates um, uh, the frankness in his, in his business partners. He, he's a good man. And however, um, he took all advantages of the, um, uh, of the, um, of the 90s and as we say, he warmed his hands on the vultures' oceans, but he never, he, he, he has never violated the law. And today he's, he's in danger. Uh, and this is uh, a sign of a positive hero. Um, um, He knows that um, he he doesn't make an impression of someone of someone very lucky. He is able to work, and he knows that everything in the world should be uh, paid for: health and happiness, and and uh, and even freedom and life. And the Hodorkovsky case is very familiar to him. He is invited to the talk show, uh, the uh, the inhabitants of. Of, mm, of heaven, and he's asked uh, very direct, very direct questions, and he and he answers these questions with his open heart. Three um, three hosts, three girls who host this mm, TV show, mm, uh, mm, very uh, sharp in their mm, in their speech mm, and very witty. And he describes his life, and he, he, he answers the questions about the collapse of the Soviet Union, about how the money was stolen, about mm, what the relations were between the capital and the Kremlin and the, and the authorities. Um, at the same time, we, uh, we witness one day of life of the, of the, of the oligarch. And actually, all this, all this performance, all this show is the uh, uh, l uh, the little scenes which which go one after another from the the TV show and the life. 
we witness his life and we witness the life of these of the girls of the of the TV hosts. Um, one of the uh, one of the heroes, the boyfriend of one of the girls, the model and the TV host Katya, Vadim. He uh, he says to her that uh, maybe you are the uh, uh, you are the the peak of the of the evolution. You, the model and the TV host. Maybe you are the the goal we were going to. Because for all 15 years, some people were yelling, some people were crying. We were we were going to the um, uh, uh, to the demonstrations. We were defending the White House, the Russian White House. We we were attacking the White House. Some of the people were were stealing money. Some of the people were killing each other. Uh, we were making fortunes. We were losing fortunes. We were uh, we were mm, holding each other by by our throats. And actually, we uh, we were setting up each other's. But actually, no one received any. Mm, any any satisfaction, any pleasure from that, any any sense, even those who got money. And maybe all that was for somebody like you. Maybe you can uh, use this money. Maybe you can use the society we have built for for some kind of uh, of uh, of of the worthwhile thing to do, or just pleasure. Well, because we are we are unable to use this money for good. Um, and at the same time, we uh, see that this Katya, this, this, this girl, she's very selfish, very greedy, very, uh, very aimed uh, to get some uh, Russian, Russian billionaire. And this guy, uh, her, her, uh, um, her boyfriend, he's, he's just a temporary step for her. And of course, we understand that she's not the one these words should be addressed to. Um, then we, uh, we witness the wonderful scene when uh, the main hero meets with his uh, friend who works at the administration of the of the president of Russia, and who uh, tells him that he has problems, that that his business, oh, I'm sorry, that his business um, um, uh, is wanted by somebody, that somebody wants to take his business out of him, uh, from him away. Oh, yes, yes, sorry, thank you. And this conversation with uh, with his friend from the from the president's administration, it 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 reveals and it shows all the cynical um, approach um, how the business and relations between the big business and the uh, power, the Kremlin, uh, are 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 arranged. And. Uh, mm, and he says, we never uh, touch anything directly. We only influence. We only suggest. We insinuate. Um, and uh, while the show goes on, sometimes we hear the phone calls of the babushka, of the grandmother of Katya, who calls her, but uh, Katya, she never answers her. She, she sees that it's it's. It's her grandmother who is calling, so her grandmother is compelled to leave a message on her answering machine on her, on her cell phone. And hearing to the voice of her babushka, we understand that that she is a woman from somewhere, probably from the little city, from the little uh, town. A, a nice, warm, and and kind voice. She is worried about her her granddaughter. She asks, "How are you? Do you need money?" It's so funny questions because her granddaughter lives in completely another world in the in the in the in the glossy world. And uh, of course, uh, 
Katya wants to to hook his, uh, this uh, the the Russian billionaire, and uh, and at the end of the play, he invites her to his car to to his limo, but he has to stay for 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 an extra hour to speak with with his friend from the uh, from the um, yes from the Kremlin's administration. And uh, and Katya uh, and Katya gets inside the car, and while she goes inside the car, the car it gets uh, it mm, it gets ex exploded. Those people who wanted to kill to kill Zaitlin, they they explode his car. So uh, Katya dies, and then we hear to to the next phone call of her babushka, who leaves the message on her cell phone. Uh, saying that I hope you're you're fine, that everything is okay, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this is a very um, very uh, strong performance about the corruption. Everything we thank you uh, we uh, um, we understand and and everything we witness from. Uh, uh, mm, this play is about the corruption of feelings, of love, of care, of um, of money, of uh, of interrelations between people. Um, the only thing people uh, is uh, is concerned about in this play, and it's also very relevant for the contemporary Russia, is the social status and. And of course, the money, and um, and people may speak about uh, the spiritual aspects, about morality, about significance of comprehending, of understanding each other, and at the same time, they would immediately betray their words and will grasp uh, the opportunity, uh, and they will violate their own words to uh, to make uh, uh, um, to make another step in uh, in the career or in some kind of the opportunity to get money uh, life as the economy this is the message of this uh, of this show life as a as a corruption in a literal meaning of this word in the meaning of of decaying of something which gets rotten and there will not be any happy end the fairy tale is 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 all over if at all it ever existed the last the last performance i would want to uh to tell you is um is called uh, Ber uh, berlus uh, putin it's the play mm, it's a play written by an outstanding italian playwright um dario fo the nobel prize winner uh, it is a stage in Italy many times, and now it was staged a year ago in Moscow in the theater dock. Uh, the, um, so this is Dario Fo, and this is the director of the play uh, Varvara Fire. She made this 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 performance. Uh, uh, so everyone knows that uh, Putin and. Mm, and uh, Berlusconi are our friends, are, are, are the close friends they used to, to say about it. Um, that is a nice photograph. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, the play is uh, about how, how Berlusconi comes to visit uh, Putin to his dacha and um, he complains him about his um, that he is mm, he is no longer a, 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 a prime minister. Mm, um, he uh, he was um, how to say I'm sorry. He was um, he was resigned, and um, mm, and he um, uh, they have a very friendly conversation. And uh, mm, at the same time, the terrorists, which want uh, who who want to kill to kill uh, 
Putin, they make a mistake and they and they explode. They explode Berlusconi, because because Berlusconi he puts on the kimono which was presented to him by uh, Putin, and it so happened uh, that uh, that Berlusconi is uh, uh, is very heavily wounded and. Uh, Putin is is uh, he, he's also wounded, and the doctors in this panic situation they say that they they are able to save only one of them, and they say that they're able to save uh, Putin who is less wounded. Only only one half of the brains are are gone, so they uh, so they transplant the right half of the brain of the Berlusconi to uh, Putin. And um, when this new creature awakes, mm, uh, so they call him Be Berlus P Putin. He he does not remember anything, and his official and his official wife um, uh, Ludmila. So they uh, they were not di di divorced yet when the play was when the play was released. So it was very very relevant. She explains him everything, uh, who is who, and how the things are done, and what's going on. But, mm, but while watching television and while getting information from people, he starts uh, to be frightened with what's going on in the country. And, um, and he's very upset of what he has done. He is, he, he is very surprised that is he who did everything who, uh, mm, uh, well, of course, this is the, mm, even not a, a satire, it's a farce. It's a po po political farce. The, uh, the, main, uh, the main thing is that the more, mm, the more human and more kind and more comprehensible, more rational, more civilized he becomes, the the less uh, the less contact with his uh, with with uh, with the administration with his uh, colleagues he gets. So uh, the the main scene of the of the performance is is when he uh, when he makes a speech. Um, uh, uh, on the background of the real of the of the of the uh, of the video of the Duma with the real deputies in Duma with their faces, and when this combination of of the actor of uh, of 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 the creature. Um, I'm sorry. To, yes. Well, he's well when he became. Uh, Verlus Putin, who tries to co to comprehend the world uh, as as if from the very beginning. Um, and uh, and this combination with the real uh, with the real footage of uh, of the state Duma of the Russian state Duma. And the and the and the actors. Uh, well, unfortunately, I don't have the photographs of of uh, of the, exactly this scene, but still, uh, it bears very strong uh, humoristic effect. Incredible and very mm, well, even harsh. The all the all the faces of the mm, of the deputies, the way they look at each other, the way they speak, the way they they move. Um, it's very, it's 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 something very very specific, and this is only visible so sharply when you see this this play, when you see this performance. So, uh, uh, he being already this uh, bicephalo, two-headed like two-headed animal, uh, he um, uh, recollects all the shameful situation in the. Po Political Russian history of the last 15 years, and mm, all the people who are around him, they they get frightened that they may lose their their 
position. So they decide, uh, so they decide to, to heal him with the, uh, with the electric shock. So, so they do it and he becomes again uh, Putin as he was before. Um, and speaking about this play, I would want to, uh, to end my uh, talk with, uh, um, with several quotes which, um, which uh, very much uh, um, correspond with this play and which illustrate this play. Uh, so Vladimir uh, Putin, the quote from him, he says that in Russia we have such kind of old ancient Russian um, zabava, how to say, the funny game, um, the search for the national idea. This is uh, something like a search of the sense of life. This is what you may be occupied with all your life. Maybe uh, this is not senseless and not an interesting way to spend the time, but uh, you will never um, gain any result. The second, the second quote is from Winston Churchill, who once said that I cannot forecast to you the action of Russia. It's a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. So, it's, well, it's very well known, uh, very well known phrase, and and also he said that well, but maybe maybe there is a key, and that key is a Russian national interest, and I would add that n no one knows and no one explains to Russians to us in our country what is the Russian interest. Uh, and Alexei Navalny, whom probably you uh, you've heard about said that the main problem in Russia is that the state became almost a mafia. So with, uh, with the Berlusconi, with all the Italian, with, uh, with all the Italian I issues, it's very close to, um, to what Navalny said. So that in, in this literally uh, Italian sense of this word, when everybody in the uh, power are uh, tied to uh, to each other are uh, tied with a, with a special connections with each other um, the only difference uh, with Italian mafia is that in Moscow we don't have a place where they all gather all to, together and also Yeltsin um, used to say very nice uh, he, he said once he said very nice uh, phrase mm when he was drunk a little bit, you know, he, uh, he used to drink. And once he entered um, the hall in Kremlin, it was very hard situation, a very difficult economical situation in Russia. And he said a wonderful phrase. He said, with his voice, he said, our country uh, stands at the edge of the abyss. But with the help of the president, he meant himself, we will make a step forward. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it, 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 it's a quote. Um, some, some people say that they want to uh, have rest in a theater. Uh, well, um, uh, the contemporary theater I was trying to uh, to speak a few words about. Uh, this is the theater uh, which um, mm, a little bit uh, steps steps um, uh, off the borders, like the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little uh, way past them into the imp possible. So these shows, these theater performances about the, the most irritating and painful social and po political, um, um, the social and po 
political issues in Russia. They, of course, are disliked by many, many people in Russia, by the, by the official, by the official, uh, by the official functionaries. Not all of them, uh, but they are very uh, popular, and um, uh, the good thing is that that they are not not getting closed. They are not getting getting forbidden. Uh, they are they are uh, kept, as we say, as a whole for the steam to to get to get out. Um, so uh, these kind of of performances, they say that we invite you, the spectators, not just to have fun, but to think, and and to think when you leave the performance, you would you will think more than, than you were thinking before you came to this performance. It's, it's from the Verlos Putin. It's, it's another thing, so. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Grigori, I think in the course of the plays which you described, I counted two car bombings, three billionaires, and five beautiful women with unbeautiful souls. So in other words, it's modern Russia. Uh, and the only question I have is, is it a comedy or a tragedy? Yulia. Uh, works. Maybe. Maybe not. Uh, well, it's... It's a good question because uh, in my very brief remarks, um, I will have more questions than answers. Um, first of all, it's very nice to have a break and be talking uh, about something else but Sochi. And I hope you're enjoying this break too, even though uh, very soon probably Sochi will appear on uh, the stages in Russia, in Moscow, in uh, different other cities. Uh, because Gregory alluded several times in his lecture that Russian theater still serves as a reflection of reality. Uh, that's what I gathered from that. Uh, albeit uh, reality art fully modified and um, oftentimes exaggerated, like in the case with uh, the uh, Berlusconi. Berlusconi was put in play at this point. Um, having watched several recent productions and having listened to Gregory's lecture, I keep asking myself a question whether reflective explanatory character of theater is still in demand in Russia. Uh, do people come to see different places to forget about grim reality or not so grim, but really grim, if we really, really think about it? Uh, or uh, do they come uh, to theater to read into reality and uh, to actually enjoy different uh, constructions and deconstructions of the meanings? Are they prepared to have honest relationship with this reality we were talking about here? Or they would rather be escapists, uh, isolated in this pleasure of consuming theater that tells them the tales of what Russian life is in the um, opinion of all these directors and um, playwrights. I remember this very auditorium a couple of years ago being transformed into a theater for a play about uh, the death of Sergei Magnitsky. A uh, Russian lawyer who was allegedly tortured to death uh, in the Russian prison Sailor is Silence uh, in uh, 09. Um, and uh, he basically just refused to drop his accusations of high ranking officials uh, in corruption. The play was called An Hour uh, and 18 Minutes. Uh, it, was, um, it was some kind of a play that merged theater, politics, and on top of that, human rights campaigning into this very powerful account of one man's tragedy uh, in the hands of, um, of a very cruel state. Uh, the play depicts the final hours of Magnitsky, and the script was based on the handwritten diaries by, kept by Magnitsky during his 358 days of incarceration, uh, documenting his ill treatment. Uh, here at Wilson Center, there was nothing very special produced for this play. Uh, that was just the stage and uh, three actors uh, on this stage, including the director of this uh, play, um, Yuri Urnov. And uh, when I interviewed Urnov afterwards, uh, he told me that it was a unique experience of a new theater for him. 
he called it socially active theater. And he characterized it as the biggest transformation from the Russian traditional theater uh, to a theater where you can drop all Aesop fables, uh, stop eluding, he said, winking at your audience and showering your audience with double meaning. And instead, he said that finally you can talk to people directly. And uh, this trend, I believe, is called new drama. And this is a new way for Russian directors and actors to reflect on the world that surrounds them. Um, in my opinion, this play was also one of the most uh, telling examples of how politics, society, and theater in Russia intertwine. Uh, the play on Magnitsky Death in Russia was staged in Theater Dog. Uh, Gregory was t uh, talking about it, and Theater Dog is uh, the theater that uh, had Berlus put in uh, play uh, so successfully uh, premiered two years ago. So uh, it was a very simple production as well. It was literally underground because uh, it was in the basement. And uh, when you see the building, you would never be able to tell that uh, there is some kind of theater there. And uh, conceptually, uh, conceptually, it was a very intimate discussion with the audience without uh, forced uh, stage uh, auditorium separation. And uh, this form, I must say, is getting increasingly popular in Russia. It seems like we're coming back to uh, this uh, format of uh, kitchen talk uh, that you probably know um, well from the Soviet history, uh, it's a kitchen talk now in a public space. Uh, so what does the resurrection of uh, this forum tells us about the Russian society and theater? Um, they still seem to be going hand in, ha in hand to in attempts to comprehend various life absurdities. And we've seen enough uh, absurdities uh, here uh, that uh, Grigori was telling about in his presentation. Uh, theater, though, sometimes rebels. Uh, we sometimes see theater as provocation, theater that startles and confuses. Uh, one of the contemporary and very uh, successful directors, Konstantin Bogomolov, um, defines his main purpose, leave the audience confused and in deep internal conflict. He also said that political provocation on stage make, uh, makes theater more successful. According to Bogomolov, his main mission now is rebellion. And he admits that he himself went to Balotne Square uh, when uh, the big Russian, uh, the big uh, anti-Putin rally was happening there in uh, 2012. And by the way, uh, the trial of Balotne activists uh, is unfolding in Russia right now uh, in front of our eyes. Uh, so uh, Bogomolov and his other colleagues admit uh, to constantly testing these boundaries. Um, it leaves me, me with a question, though. Um, are contemporary Russian directories uh, trying to uh, rebel so hard in this confined space because they know that um, they're well aware of the fact that these attempts uh, can go, uh, cannot go any further than their stages? Uh, clearly defined stages or merged, uh, much like the Russian society as a whole. We understand that there are boundaries, and no matter how rebellious we become, we will not go further, we will not be allowed. In this slide, I would also very br briefly would like to compare how censorship in Russian theater started to uh, uh, reshape, uh, to be reshaped of late. Uh, no doubt there is traditional pressure from the uh, state authorities, we know about this, uh, but uh, there is also this uh, society-created censorship, and um, I would like to um, just mention the case uh, in Theater Doc again um, that we, ha we have been talking about here. It was a attacked by a group of unknown people one evening when the play about the trial of Russian punk band uh, Pussy Riot was on. Uh, the group was escorted by the crew of the Russian uh, state-controlled uh, channel and TV, and they were later identified as Russian Orthodox activists led by certain uh, Dmitry and Tao. And this very uh, same person orchestrated a big campaign against uh, the play by Konstantin Bogomolov, an ideal husband. Uh, we don't know how this uh, trend is really going to unfold, but the only thing that uh, seems obvious is uh, that uh, the clear hierarchy of the past 
where a theater would always lead the audience and be um, a thought trend setting institution is gone. And now it is more and more of a guessing game of what inspires and provokes what and who inspires and provokes who. And Russian theater right now, it seems to me, uh, is at the crossroads and might be at a loss where exactly it's going. And it seems like uh, it is the best illustration of the dynamics we see happening in the Russian society. And that's exactly, Matt, you asked about it. I didn't answer the question, but theater in society. Here. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much, Julia. And thank you again, Grigori. Uh, really, I think, fantastic. Um, I was actually especially surprised to hear of an instance of, I don't know, is, would it be fair to call it samizdat theater, sort of theater on a, on a small scale, intimate, sort of human made, as opposed to everything else in Russia, which doesn't it seem to be going in the direction of being endorsed by the state and funded by the state and organized by the state. We, of course, deal with the Russian Academy of Sciences institutions, all of which are now being rolled up and booted out and, mm -hmm. and taken over by the state. But anyway, um, we have time for questions, uh, and we have uh, colleagues, I think, who have microphones, so please. Anyone? Otherwise, I'll, I'll take over, but Blair? I, I'm really wondering, in listening to this presentation, if the new Russian drama isn't already the old Russian drama in a very important way, and I think uh, it, this circles around some of the issues about changes in Russian society. If you think about the shocking plays of a decade ago, they were on small scales, they were in small theaters, um, although some of the playwrights wrote for TV and for, for uh, movies, but uh, a lot of the theater was very small and there was the profanity and there were the despicable acts, but often there was a transformational, transcendental moment of salvation. The plays you describe, there's no moment of salvation. Is this a difference in trend? Is, it, 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 it does, is this observation correct? And if it is correct, is this saying something about the kind of state of thinking about Russian society? Um, salvation in the meaning, I'm sorry, just to, uh, to understand you exactly what you mean. Um, um, an example, I'm, I'm not remembering the name of the play, but there was a play about, uh, written by the, the Presnikov brothers, and it was about um, two children left at home. They're sort of 10, 12 years old. Turns out their parents were drug dealers. The other drug gang was coming to kill them and to burn down their house. It was full of profanity, and they were just mm -hmm. about to die when suddenly Pikavai Adama appears and saves them. Or there are other plays, particularly coming out of uh, the Urals or out of Toliadi, where the most despicable characters have a moment when their human goodness is revealed. There's no revelation in mm -hmm. these plays. There's no human goodness lurking underneath all of this. Right. And I guess my question is, is this a change in, you know, Maybe I'm overstating what came before, but is this a change in how Russia is thinking about itself? Um, it's the way uh, theater directors and playwrights now uh, uh, start to dare to show their reality. They are going away from mm, uh, trying to calm people. They are uh well i'm i'm sorry for my english they 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 try to show the very uh the very reality without uh without um mm, uh, um without making some kind of um mm, uh, um some kind of um mm, um <coughs> of moral uh, of moral agreement with some good characters uh, actually you won't be able to find any good characters well except for maybe Venichka who gets drunk but um, uh, 
uh, I may uh, name you several wonderful performances, uh, also by Konstantin Bogomolov, whom you mentioned already, at the Mhat Theater. Uh, he staged the Karamazov Brothers. Uh, he staged the Ideal Husband by, uh, by Oscar Wilde. And there you won't be able to find anybody decent. Uh, it's the frightening landscape. Uh, it is very shocking, and that's why we have many um, groups of, of people, well, not many, but some groups of people very, very active. The Russian Orthodox, very, very fanatic Russian Orthodox, or some other people who uh, invade the theaters, not only in theater dog, but also on the, on the performance of Konstantin Bagamolov just recently in, uh, at the beginning of January, they, uh, they rushed into the theater, the Mhat theater, the, and it's considered to be the main theater uh, of Russia. Uh, the official theater, but the performance, it's the ideal husband. It's very, very provocative and very, I would say, um, even harsh, harsh word, very um, strong, uh, yes. And uh, that's what some of the critics say that, hey, you, you are not leaving us any, any, any hope. You are showing us the uh, picture of the total, of the total, uh, of the total devastation of everything, of culture, of the spiritual, um, of the spiritual abilities, of 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 the of the connections between the the children and parents, and the directors say, well. Yes, you'd better watch TV, watch the news, what's happened, what, um, and, uh, mm, and you pay attention what happens in Russia. We just try to show little corner of what we are able, thankful to, to Glasnost, which is still uh, on the TV. You may, uh, you may, uh, you may witness the, the criminal perp programs and everybody understands well actually what's going on uh, in the country so we're just we're just trying to uh, show the reality uh, we uh, mm, we we uh, mm, we we stopped uh, showing you uh, the heroes who may um, who may smoothen, uh, who may smooth this, the situation, who may, well, how to say, I'm sorry, uh, who may, um, uh, <coughs> who may, um, uh, uh, yes, uh, polish the situation, who may, uh, who may rescue people. We don't see such a, such a heroes anymore. Interesting that in contrast with Hollywood, where everybody saves everybody, uh, Russian theater is completely different. But uh, for me, the interesting thing about this is the psychological question and uh, the interaction between the Russian audience and Russian theater and this, uh, you know, outbreaks of or outcries of Russian society, m maybe uh, just parts of the Russian society, but people just, you know, storming theaters and uh, claiming that uh, they don't like the productions, maybe it's just an attempt uh, by uh, certain segments of society to uh, fight for their right to favorite tales. Maybe they just want to preserve some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of right to be able to be told uh, nice stories about the reality that surrounds them. And I don't know if we can just completely deprive them of this. And uh, if you uh, go and see uh, maybe the latest season uh, in uh, Moscow, uh, you will be uh, shocked more than you will be pleased with what you see and shocked in a sense that, uh, as Bagamolov says, uh, I want to startle people, I want to uh, leave people in deep internal conflict. So this is probably going to be, to be your impression from the uh, 
uh, from the latest uh, production. So for me, the question is uh, how negative we can go and uh, how negative mm -hmm. we have the right to go with this or the, the mm -hmm. uh, theater has a right to go with this. Yes, please. Just uh, wait for the microphone, please. Clearly, uh, you know, this is an example of art imitating life. So if that is life in uh, Russia at this uh, uh, juncture, uh, to some extent it's also um, the same all over the world. You know, in many other countries, this confusion and this lack of personal respect and this lack of some kind of human uh, feeling, fellow feeling. Uh, so in some sense, Russia is not peculiar, but I'm curious, what is the response of the state? Uh, I'm juxtaposing this kind of theater with similar theater in Pakistan, which I'm very familiar with. And of course, the state responds very harshly uh, with huge censorship. Um, so what's, what's the response of the state? And how are these, uh, these uh, um, ideas uh, being received by young people themselves. I mean, you the the play about those four young people. I'm sure you know it's it reflects the reality of the young people who are sitting in the audience. Yeah. You know, university students, college college students. How do they respond? You know, what is is the theater being able to achieve the thinking objective that you had said that you know we you would like audience to go back thinking much more than they came in. So is do you see that happening? Well, yes, absolutely. That what happens. Uh, the funny thing is that the uh, well, and uh, and the curious thing is that we have eighty-eight the uh, eighty-eight theaters in Moscow. It's an it's enormous number of theaters. It's very much. They all work. They all all of them. You won't believe all of them get money from the state except for Theater Doc, which is which is a private theater and actually exists uh, very strangely. And it may be closed any time. And the authorities do not close theater dog just, just because, well, they understand that it will be a, a big uh, shame and big cry and big yelling around if, if, they would, if they would do it. But everybody, of course, very concerned what's going to happen after the Olympics. So, uh, but answering your question, uh, the theaters get money from the state. We have very poor regulations and laws so that it's very hard to get money from the private investors. It's not profitable for them. They cannot detect them from, uh, from their income. Yes? And um, so, as we say, the main art of the theater in Russia is the art of getting the money from the state. And at the same time, yes, the, the censorship is rather uh, mild. <coughs> Even at the Mhat Theater, such a performance is mm, uh, done by Konstantin Bogomolov, not only in Mhat Theater, at the Gogol Center by Kirill Serebrenikov, at the many little, little theaters are very relevant and very, and very, um, very open. Uh, Young people, uh, I, I would say that probably theater is the most active and most spoken about uh, art in Moscow. Not the movies, not the cinema. And, th and this is a very significant thing because theater is a conditional art. So that, <coughs> I'm sorry, so that you may somehow hide uh, uh, the direct meaning under the under the conditional art, farce, satire, um, some kind of, uh, of costumes, decorations, the, uh, the, way, the way people act, play on stage, so that mm, uh, the authors of the performance would say, oh, come on, this is a game. Uh, and if you make a film, here it starts being much more serious, and we have severe uh, stories about some films that were shot and even the documentary films that were never released in in um, in Russia we have some slight move in the uh, in the movies uh, 
in the direction of of the openness but still the films as the art of uh like like the hidden camera you know they they demand much more um much more open and much more frank approach to the material to the way it is done so uh the theater it uh took the uh the uh the torch the the, the torch of of mm, uh, of not all theater just in you know it's it's maybe two hands are enough to count the theaters in moscow uh among those 88 theaters mm, uh, those theaters who have the productions of the of the new drama and the and the uh, and the newest new drama uh the vast majority of the theaters they are not uh of the new theaters even they are not new theaters they are very very traditional and we have still a uh, a uh, big number of people who prefer the traditional theater they go to mali theater they want to watch they they want to watch classical performances or some kind of contemporary performances but uh but um uh, they want it to be comfortable see so th and the young people and not only young people but the middle and many many from the old generation from more aged generation from the intellectuals they are very active in uh, mm, uh, uh, in visiting uh, in visiting these 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 uh, these places that uh, that I was speaking about I just I just choose um, four four performances out of maybe maybe 12 uh well I, well i had i had 21 but then 12 then i had to to stop for the most fixed one uh it is also when we speak about authorities and how they control theater in russia uh they're smart and uh it is all about risk assessment uh, the uh, audience for uh, Russian theater in Moscow, people try to go, obviously, uh, is also very expensive. And uh, not that many people can afford uh, this luxury of going and, uh, you know, getting all these new meanings and getting uh, all these rebellious ideas. So they think, uh, why not? I mean, we keep this uh, very small fraction of people who um, showcase their thoughts this way, and uh, a very small fraction of people will actually see it. So in terms of censorship, uh, at this point, they cannot be bothered. And uh, they will be more concerned if uh, television shows something like uh, exactly. Verilis Putin. It will never appear on television, obviously. Yes. So risk assessment uh, now tells them that it's not dangerous yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we've got 10 minutes left, and I see a number of hands up. So why don't we take uh, the two questions right here, Wayne and then the gentleman in the uh, brown ish grayish sweater together uh I'd, I'd like to know whether there's been any expression of interest from uh, producers in this country to uh, adapt or any of these productions for stages uh here i mean you know washington is now a much more interesting theater city than it used to be and some rather interesting stages uh and i must say i'm quite surprised that uh, uh something by dario foes certainly one of the most famous playwrights of my lifetime uh, has not, uh, on such a topical topic as Silvio Berlusconi and Vladimir Putin, has not received more international attention. Uh, I mean, one of the most hysterical evenings I ever spent in a theater was 35 years ago at the Deutsche Theater in East Berlin when they did Accidental Death of an Anarchist, which was a, supposedly a satire in Italy, but everyone in that theater understood mm -hmm. it was a satire in East Germany. Of course. Uh, I'm surprised that it, that uh, 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 something as topical by a man li like Dario Fo has not uh, actually gotten more more attention, uh, uh, and I'm wondering why not. Okay, and and let's take two at a time. Uh, I was just curious, very quickly, about censorship. Uh, we've been talking about performance, which I appreciate, but uh, are these scripts being uh, published? Mm -hmm. Are they? Are people wanting to read them? Are they collected in journals or, or books? Uh, well, about about uh, about Dario Fo, I agree with you absolutely. I 
it's it's strange that uh, it is not staged uh, in uh, in Europe. It is staged in Italy, and the Russian version is the adaptation of of his play, where more attention is given to. Uh, Putin than to than to Berlusconi. The original play is more about Berlusconi, so it's it's a sort of the adaptation with his uh, agreement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, um, yes, I would love to I I I would love to uh, mm, uh, stage some of the contemporary Russian um, uh, some of the contemporary Russian plays in uh, in Washington, and I'm sure that there are other. There are other directors who speak English well enough who can who can cope with um, with rehearsals with actors who are able to do it or American directors. Uh, so I d I don't have an answer to to your well sort of question um, as about your question about the uh, the plays themselves the um, uh, um, the scripts yes they are not issued in books they uh, th they're in the internet or in the magazines, in some thick, as we call them, thick literary or dramaturgical magazines. But actually, uh, they're in the internet. You may easily find them there. Just one very last remark. Uh, I wanted to share about the uh, experience of other directors who tried to stage uh, Russian theater on American mm. on American stage, and I'm speaking about Magnitsky now, Magnitsky play. And uh, Yuri Urinov was just sharing with me how difficult for him it was to uh, work uh, with American actors on this Russian material, because it's not that they're not talented or they're not talented enough. It is just so difficult to explain them all the Russian realities that are being reflected in all this place. And he was saying that uh, when we were talking about uh, state investigators, Russian actors hearing the word investigator, you have these layers of collective memory that affect you right. and uh, that create this right. feeling and uh, the cr uh, that create this right response uh, that any director would want from actors. And American actors are not familiar with that because uh, investigator is a very neutral word here. So they just needed to go through history, through layers of history and just explaining people how it works and what the attitude should be. Uh, I think it's just one of the obstacles of trying to stage something Russian originated here in America. Mm -hmm. Blair, did you want to just say one word uh, with reference to Wayne's question about the uh, performances in Washington? Because I think this is relevant. Very quickly, some of these plays, there, there's a theater in Austin, Texas that is, is constantly putting on contemporary Russian theater. And uh, it's a very important source for integrating Russian theater into American theater. Um, and there are a couple of theaters in New York, but about a year from now, Woolly Mammoth, which has a very deep interest in Russian theater, is going to invite five or six Moscow-based companies to come to present exactly these plays here in Washington. And um, Yuri Onoff is the kind of mastermind behind this. So you will be, have an opportunity to see these plays here. And Washington is actually one of the more receptive places for this kind of theater. And we will co-host some activities around that. And so. it is a wonderful auditorium for this. For, for a small production uh, yeah. with Magnitsky play, it was just excellent. Uh, nothing else was needed. Yeah, great. OK, um, one very last quick question, and, and then I think we need to wrap up. Well, Wait for the mic. Well, first, quick comment. Uh, also, just a reminder that Studio Theater actually did do a series of contemporary Russian plays. I think it was about a decade ago, and it did very well. Um, for some reason, um, there was a period when contemporary Russian theater was actually quite popular in the city. I can remember for a couple of years, and then it just dropped off. Um, but I think my question may have been pretty much answered earlier, but I'm just curious to know, have any of these plays been staged anywhere outside of Moscow? And, and I don't mean St. Petersburg. <laughs> okay. um, yes, some of these plays were staged in, Ye in, uh, in Yekaterinburg, in, uh, um, uh, in Kiev, 
well, that's the other country, but by the way, yes. <laughs> um, uh, no, not very much. Only in the main in, in Novosibirsk, but the difference between Moscow and these cities are that it's much more censorship in these in this cities. Uh, the local authorities are much more frightened than than the Caesar himself, you know? So so yes, so they uh, want to serve and to keep situation more loyal, to be, as we say, more uh, loyal than than the king mm, himself. But in Moscow, I, I just want to add a, f a few words. Um, uh, I was speaking just recently with the with the financial director of the big and famous famous Moscow theater and the art director of the theater. He wants very much to stage this play about Andrei Kurpsky, the prince who, uh, the Russian prince who escaped from Ivan Grozny from mm, yes from Ivan the Terrible. <coughs> And he was blaming, and he was blaming uh, Ivan Grozny of the, all the atrocities that he made, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, the play is written in such a way that there are some hints and some associations with the contemporary situation in Russia. Well, of course, not to the all the um, all the bloody all the bloody things, but the psychological way uh, the brain of someone who holds the power of uh, as the as the authoritarian leader how how the brain works so uh, the financial uh, the financial director he says uh, well you know Gregory well we are the the strong theater we are the po power theater I want to I I want you I want you to to stage it very much but uh, how is that how is that that we will I, I'm sorry it's just um, how is that we will, with one hand, we will be uh, taking the money from the state, and with the other hand, we will be staging this kind of uh, play. And I said, well, your artistic director, he wants it very, yes, I know, he said, but, but would you answer this question? I said, well, you know, it's, it's the history. It's the history of our country. If there are some associations, okay, it's fine because this is what the history is uh, per, is uh, mm, uh, is um, is the is uh, is um, is so valid for for uh, for us that we can that we can understand. And and at last, I said, it's about the 16th century, and now we have the beginning of the 21st century in Russia. And and. And he leaned forward and he lowered his uh, voice and said, "Did you do you do you look around? Are you sure in your words?" Are, uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think I think we need to thank both of our speakers once again and uh, all of you for joining us. And and I am confident that with this evening's discussion uh, and everything that we've learned and, and brought up here, we've done honor to Admita's memory, and, uh, and I, I know that we'll continue to do it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.